Father, we come before you, your throne of grace. We come ready to be fed by your word. We come ready to hear a right now word for the times that we are living in. Lord, I am just a humble vessel, an instrument used by you. In this hour, I decrease that you may increase. Let your word be made manifest upon the hearers of your word, Lord. Lose ourselves in time that we're not anxious about the time. Because in you there is no time. But let your word birth eternity in our hearts. I thank you right now that our hearts are open and our mind is alert to hear what your word is telling to each and every one of us on this morning. So Father God, come in with your power and do what only you can do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 61 is an awesome year. My father never quite made it to 61. He passed at age 58. So I'm honored that I could be represented in my generation as a man that's been processed by God. When I think about the goodness of God in the land that we live in, when I think about the faithfulness of God, the journey that I have taken, it's a journey that have taken 61 years to get to this moment. I don't make light of this moment. I didn't come here with a message for this Sunday. I came here with a life a life that's been processed by God himself. This past Wednesday we talked about how Jesus had a hard time in his own city with his own family members, cousins and friends that he went to school with, and elementary school with, and junior high, high school. I don't know how the education system was, but just to make it relevant to where we're at. And the Bible says that in that city where his family and friends was, cousins and uncles and nieces and nephews, people who he did life with, that when God came upon him at a very early age, he was a strange person, so much strange that the mama knew that that boy just being, he being Jesus. He would get lost and be found, not he getting lost, but away from his parents. And they would find him at a young age in the house of God ministering to older leaders of that time, religious leaders of that time. And they were so astonished with his wisdom that they said, all this coming out of this young person? And then there'll be another time that he will walk into a temple and the person that was in that temple was assigned to that temple as an intercessor. And her only prayer was that she would see the Lord Jesus before she would leave this earth. And as a boy child, she discerned that that was Jesus who the Bible had prophesied about all those many years ago. He was literally there, but she had been praying, praying to see him, to be able to recognize him because nobody knew who he was. But the Lord spoke to her and said, this is he who you've been praying for. This is he that you've been interceding for. We get to a moment that we all have to do some soul searching, especially when you have lived a life. When I was living in Dallas, Texas, we didn't have iPhones, iPads. We didn't have the GPS system. That technology wasn't available. We had what you call a map, a literal map. Dallas had what they called Map Skull, which was many cities with maps inside of a little book. And because I was sailing out there, I had to know how to read the map to know my location, my destination. And if you know anything about Dallas and the surrounding area, it's, it's, it's a metropolitan, it's very busy and condensed. And so I thought to myself, 
when the Lord found me, what condition I was in. Because I had no direction. Because I had no map. I didn't have nobody to tell me that this is the way from point A to point B. And I kept praying for direction and didn't know anything about prayer. I was just talking to my mother's God, my mother's Savior. He wasn't my God, he wasn't my Savior. And I kept, she kept telling me that he's real, baby, he's real, he's alive, baby. She said, seek him, baby, seek him. And she drilled into all of her kids, a, a scripture verse. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and what's right where he's concerned. And then he's going to add everything you need to your life. But I didn't want to hear that because it didn't meet me where I was at. But only because I was an awakening in my spirit. I hadn't made a commitment. I hadn't made a decision what direction I was going in. But if you don't have a map in life, you don't know what direction you're going in as a believer. And you listen to any and everything. And right now, the, where we, the, the, the times we are living in, you have to have a discerning heart, discerning ears to know the truth of God and not get caught up on the hype around the things of God. I hear God saying a lot of stuff, and I'm the God I know don't talk that much. He don't talk that much. But I'm hearing God say a lot, God wants you to do this. God wants you to be, really? Mm, let's talk about it, shall we? The title of my message to, this morning is, I will make you. I will make you. I will make you. I want you to go with me to Jesus, Matthew chapter 12. We've been talking about discipling. We've been talking about getting back in the family of God. We're talking about, we're not talking getting back in the family of God with the assignment that's on the family of God. Not just being a Christian and looking to get blessed and looking to be highly favored of the Lord. We know all of that. We got all that down pat. But if you really was to analyze that, where are you at with that? How blessed are you? How much favor do you have? And if you find yourself maybe in a deficit of blessings, a deficit of, a deficit of flavor, uh, favor, it could be that, you know what, I've been going in the wrong direction. I've been following the wrong thing or person. So Jesus come. Let me set it up for you. Jesus come at a time before we get to this moment. He has already been baptized. John the Baptist, his cousin, was baptizing people. He, God sent him with a message to prepare for Jesus' ministry. And God sent John the Baptist, raised him up with a strong conviction in his heart because he knew how he created this world and he knew that the world was going in a wrong direction. So he sent somebody with something in their heart to tell them, no, tell them, this is the way. They're going in the wrong direction. They don't have a map to go by. They don't have a GPS to go by. So they're going by culture at the time. They're going by the world's way at the time. They're going by trends and fashions at the time. And then all of a sudden, God shows up on a scene in the body of a man called John the Baptist and put something in him and say, this is your only ministry. You will have no other message other than this one message. And the message was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, repent. He says, that's the only message I'm giving you is tell the people to repent. They don't know. And he got this wild man in the wilderness eating wild locusts. Honey, don't look like nobody should be listening to this man. He's dressed with dead animal fur on his back. He look crazy. He sound crazy. But something about him sounds holy. And the people start hearing the message about John the Baptist raising up a church. If it was in this time, he would have a national ministry. Tens of thousands was coming to John the Baptist. I hear your message. Repent. Repent. But he was the forerunner who went before Jesus. He prepared the way for Jesus. God will always send a forerunner before he shows up with a message of warning so that my people can get right. My people can turn and go in the direction that I created for them to live in. 
And in that moment, Jesus shows up in time. The one that's been prophesied from, a, from the book of Isaiah, been prophesied that one day this man will come and he will be the light to this world. He'll be the savior of this world. So Jesus coming, because everybody else, get, Jesus would never do anything that if we're doing something and he know that God has told us to do this, he's going to fall, fall in line with that. He don't go do nothing else other than what the Father told him. So everybody else getting baptized, Jesus say, well, listen, I'm humble at heart. I know I'm God, but guess what? I, in, in this moment, I'm human. And I got to get baptized just like everybody else. I got to identify with the message just like anybody else. So the Bible says that when Jesus came and got baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin, the Bible says that all three of the Godheads showed up. God the Father, God the Son was already there in the body of Jesus. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove from heaven on Jesus. The Holy Spirit that came on us, that we say we feel with the Spirit. But do you look like you feel with the Spirit? Do you sound like you feel with the Spirit? He says, listen, the Father spoke. He says, this is my son. I identify with him. And I'm well pleased with him. And the Bible says that after the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus, the moment was over with. Life begins to happen again. Jesus go on to the next part of his assignment. The Bible says that after the Spirit filled him, somebody say, filled him. Somebody, now I hear, filled him. It led him someplace. And it led him to the wilderness. Well, I thought I was supposed to be saved and my peace was supposed to be back to me. And I, I thought if I gave my life to Jesus, everything would be all right. I thought my prayers would be answered. I thought peace would come to my home. I thought my marriage would be right. I thought my kids would get in line. I thought my finances would get right. I thought my mind would get right. But this spirit that led me into more drama. Why? Why was he led? He was led so that God can show himself strong through the temptations that Jesus would face in the wilderness. The devil will come to all of us to test what you got in you. Coming to church, you think that's it? No, baby, that ain't it. When I, when I think about Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted tempted with material stuff we're going to talk about all these things in Sundays and Wednesdays to come tempted with bread bread meaning the sustenance of life what you need to live with tempted with uh, 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 ambition I'll take you to the highest mountain and everything you see I'll give you clout I'll give you fame I'll give you fortune. Jesus came back with the word that was inside of him. Because the devil will quote the same word that you're trying to learn. He knows. He was with the Father. He's a creation from the Father. He knows the word better than some of us know the word. He's been around for genera generations and generations. So he knows you by the generation that came before you. Whether it's generational cursing or generational blessing, there's a DNA inside of each and every one of us. Then we got a break. And so now we get to this place here. That now Jesus have fought the devil, won every temptation the devil brought to him. Now the Bible says that he's led out of the wilderness. And now he's getting ready to go to his first assignment. His first ministry assignment. Now God can use him. Somebody say, now God can use him. He'd been filled and he'd been tested and found to be the son of God. Some of us maybe would have felt one of those temptations. Maybe the first one, maybe the second one, maybe the third one. But the enemy is relentless. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Well, let me send some things your way to prove that you love me with all your heart, all your might, and all your soul. 
Jesus showed that by his obedience. No, I'm hungry, but I'm not going to create my own food. No, I know I have a purpose on my life, but I'm not going to create my own purpose. No, I know I have, I know I have some influence. I know I have some influence. I know I have some clout, but I'm not going to create my own influence. I will make you. I will make you. Jesus begins in his ministry. When Jesus heard, let's, let's just go to the scriptures now. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested and put in prison, the one who baptized Jesus, now he's arrested, he left for Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the country of Zebulun and Naphtali. This, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Oh my God, 630 years it would take before that prophecy become the past. Isn't it something that God can speak to something in one generation and you don't see it to another generation? But your job is to hold the promise. Hold the promise for your grandkids. It may not happen in your generation, but in your grandkids' generation. Big Papa, you got to carry the promise, Big Papa. You got to get, listen, till they get up until they find their own way, you got to carry the promise, Big Papa. 630 years, Jesus shows up fulfilling that prophecy. Verse 15 says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephetila by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee and the district of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting living in spiritual darkness have seen a great light. They was living, they was, they was, they was, they knew there was a Jesus. They knew there was, but they was living in unbelief, darkness. They was living with no faith, darkness. They was living in fear, darkness. He says, now Jesus have come. We have seen a great light. And for those who were sitting, living in the land, and the shadow of spiritual and moral death, upon them a light has dawned. Now, a light dawned on all of us. When we're in our dark places in the valley portion of our lives, in the most tempting places of our life, in the places where we are undone and unfinished, undone and unfinished, he meets us in those places. In a minute, I want to share with something, share something with you. Because the next verse he says, this was Jesus' message. He's, there's no new message under heaven. Now he's taken the message that John had. John's message was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's about to come in, John, it says. I'm about to open up a whole new thing for you. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is about to be available to you and I. And he's telling about this kingdom and who's carrying the kingdom. He just ain't pointing to Jesus just yet. But now he says, Jesus' message. From that time, Jesus began to preach. Somebody say preach. And say repent. Change your inner self. Your old way of thinking. Regret past sins. You can't, it's not enough to be forgiven of past sins. Do you regret those past sins? Do you have remorse about the things you did wrong by? Sometimes we like to put the, sweep the dirt underneath the rug and act like we all forgot about it. Some people are holding stuff in their hearts because somebody never came and repented, never came and asked for forgiveness, never asked God for forgiveness. They all went, well, I was right. I was justified. No, Jesus was your justification. He shed the blood. We all have sinned and fall short of God's glory in our life. We are none perfect. What we deserve is his wrath, but he's gave us his grace. Thank you for a few little hand claps on this side. I'm going to drill down a little bit longer. Because I know we don't like to talk about our dirt. We like to leave our sin in the past. Sin is ugly. The Bible says that sin is, listen, sin is fun for a season. Man, why are you doing that sin, man? You having some big fun. You balling. Sin is dope for a season. Until the season ends. And now, all of a sudden, next season says, now it's time for you to pay up. You was dope over here. You was dope over here. You was rocking over here. But now, but now, guess what? 
Every seed you sow, every seed you sow, be it good or bad, a harvest is coming. The thing about a seed is that it looks like, it, it, it looks like it's not powerful in seed form. But when that seed starts germinating in whatever that seed was planted in, and then the harvest show up, man, that harvest show up big. Listen, the thing I learned about sin, it takes you further than you want to go. I never intended to go this far. And it keeps you longer than you want to stay. So he says, so, so Jesus comes and says, listen, I know y'all. I created y'all. I know exactly who you are. I've walked with you. I've touched everything that you feel on the inside. Your temptations and your hope and your despair and your courage and you want to be this and you want to be great and who would be the greatest in the kingdom? But if you're to be great in the kingdom, then you're to be the least in the kingdom. Oh, what? No. No. You mean, Tim, I got to go down low for I can come up high? I will make you. You can't make yourself. I will make you. Look what he says. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent. Change your inner self. Not your exterior, your inner self. Your old way of thinking. Change your perspective. See a different paradigm. See God's purpose for your life, he says. For the kingdom of heaven is now at hand. It's not coming, it's here. The kingdom has showed up through the life of Jesus Christ, through the person of Jesus Christ. Now look what he says. You're not getting nothing else other than what came. Because it was supernatural how I got here, and it's going to be supernatural when I return. The first disciple says this here. As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he noticed two brothers. He noticed two brothers. Landon and Demetrius. He noticed two brothers. He noticed two brothers. Listen, he noticed two brothers. And Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting their net in the sea, for they were fishermen. They had a life, they had a career, they had a business. They was fishermen. They got up every morning and they went fishing. Not for pleasure, to go and come back to the city and town and sell it. They was doing commerce, they was doing business. They was in their purpose, y'all. Nobody could fish like them. They knew how to fish. And God said, he said, he said listen, I like Jesus, I like Jesus, look what he says. And he said to them, follow me. Follow me. Wait, 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 wait. Follow me. Let's just unpack that for a minute. Follow me. Where are we going? What's the plan? You got a vision? Lord, what's the vision for my life? I need to see the vision first before I follow you. Tell me my purpose first before I follow you. Tell me my assignment first before I follow you. Tell me my talent and my gift first before I follow you. That's what we think. He ain't giving no answers. Look what he says. He says, and he said to them, follow me as my disciples, accepting me. Look what he says. This is my condition. Accepting me as your master and teacher and walk in the same path of life that I walk. No other path. Same path. Same path. You're going to roll till the wheel. You're going to ride with me till the wheels fall off. Okay. We gonna find, life going to prove that out. Life going to pull that out. I'm going to send a test your way. You still, you still on track? You still on point? I kind of got distracted over here with my situation. So I stopped following Jesus. Because I got distracted by life. Peter was good while he was walking the water, focused on Jesus. He's standing on stuff that normally he can't stand on in his mind, in his emotions, in his mentality. I can't stand on this here. But while I got my eyes on Jesus, man, you see, it's something about when you get your eyes on Jesus, your posture change. You see, you, you ain't lackadaisical, you ain't lazy, you committed. I'm following this person. I believe in this person. I trust in this person. I got confidence in this person. I'm following him. I don't care what come my way, storms and winds and distractions of life and heartbreaks and pains, I'm following him. 
though it's costing me all to follow him. He sees my sacrifice. He sees my mind. He sees my obedience. He sees my faithfulness. I'm following him. I'm following him. I ain't breaking. Money funny. Marriage funny. Family funny. My mind funny. My emotions funny. But I'm following him. I got some doubt, but I believe more than I doubt. I'm following him. I don't know how you're going to bring me through, but I'm following you. I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. I lack. I lack. I lack. What he says next. Verse 20. Immediately. Was there no going back home and fasting? Was there no praying? Was there no calling the, the most spiritual person you know? No, no, no. I heard. I didn't hesitate. I heard. Faith is now. Faith is now. Faith is, I heard. I heard him talk to me. I got to follow him. He got my destiny in his hand. I don't know. I got to leave all, but I'm going to leave all to gain all. I got to follow him. Immediately, I heard the call, and I followed him. It may have taken me 35 years, but I've been following him. I may have been falling down and getting up, 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 down and getting up but I'm following him. I'm following him. I ain't gonna break stride. I ain't gonna. Immediately. Not tomorrow. Today. Follow me. I will make you. Somebody say, I will make you. He will make you. Immediately, they left their nets. They left what they was previous doing in their life and followed him, becoming something. Becoming something. Becoming what? His disciples. You can't just say you're following and you don't look like him. You don't sound like him. You don't act like him. Life will test what you're following. Life will test what you're following. Pressure on the pipe. Out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speak it. They left their nets and they followed him becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him. And they follow his examples. And going further from there, he noticed two other brothers, Terry and Ronald. <laughs> he noticed two other brothers. I'm calling these names out, that's my brothers, y'all. And going on further from there, he noticed two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. Some fellow businessmen. Funny how Jesus came and got these people who knew how to work some nets. They know how to work their hands. They weren't sitting around just praying and fasting and waiting for God to come and drop something on him. No, he called them while they was working at their craft. Mending their nets, he called them to follow him as his disciples. And again, the response was the same. Immediately, they left the boat. They left their lives. They left the things that they was connected to. And their father, and followed him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him, and following his examples. Following his examples. Let me share something with you. They was doing something. When Jesus is walking in and through your life, we are all doing something. At different stages in our life, we're doing something. Some have evolved. Some, he meet right there at the beginning of their journey. He met me in the beginning of my journey. And he starts speaking things into my life. The things he spoke into my life was unattainable, was unattainable with this capacity, was unattainable with this vessel. 
Let me put context to it. Because see, we don't like to talk about our past. But for the relevancy of God's power working in a person's life, you got to talk about your past. Because your past is your testimony. You see, you got to talk about your past. Your past is your testimony. He came in my life. And what he found was, what he found was a crackhead. He found a crackhead. He found a hope. He found a hope and a crackhead. He found a person that had anger issues. He found a person that had rebellious issues. He found a person who didn't know how to obey his parents. He, did, he found a person who wouldn't take counsel from nobody else because he thought he knew it all. He was headstrong. He came and found that person. He found me in the muck and mire of my life. He found me in the mud of my life. What I like about God was that he came and he sit with me and I didn't even know he was sitting with me. He was sitting with me. In my mess, in my mess, I was deceived by my mess. I thought I was good in my mess. But he came and found this crackhead boy. This boy who was a whoremonger, who didn't have no consciousness for right or wrong. Everything he did, he thought was in his, was, he, everything he thought in his mind, he did. He came and found a thief and a robber. At age 17, I robbed a store at Knife Point because I was caught up in my own craziness. See, you can't appreciate what you see until you know my story. Until you know my story. You can't appreciate the power of God until you know my story. He found us someplace. We all were someplace. We all were someplace engaged in something. But it came in the darkness of our mess and said that my grace is sufficient. I know you don't understand. I know you're confused. I know you feel abandoned. I know you feel rejected. But I understand you. I understand you. One day I'm going to make you. One day I'm going to make you. Follow me. Follow me. I'm going to make you one day. I'm going to make you one day. So I stand here. I don't have time for games. I love everybody. I don't judge. How can I judge? Look at my past. If God could save a wretch like me, I was wretched. I was wretched and ratchet. You was wretched and ratchet. I was found in my sins, dead in my own trespasses. But I found a God who said, I got a promise. I got a place for you. Follow me. Follow me. Become my disciple. Become my disciple. I will make you. I will make you. No, you don't know how to be a father, but I will make you into a father. No, you don't know how to be a pastor. I will make you into a pastor. No, you don't know how to be a husband. I will make you into a husband. Oh. The God that saves, the God that delivers, the God that restores, the God that redeems. If you ever ask me, Pastor, why you serve? Because he served me first. Because he served me first. He served me first. He said, I came, I came, I came to serve and not be served. I came to serve and not be served. We're supposed to be serving a living God. We serve a living God. We serve a living God. The devil will do everything he can to tip you from not becoming. Becoming what? A disciple. I got one question right now. Do I have some wannabe disciples in the room? Do I have some wannabe disciples in the room? Do I have some wannabe disciples online? 
grab some wanna be disciples online. Do you wanna follow Christ? Do you wanna be like Christ? Do you wanna let Christ make you and mold you into the very image that he designed for you to be? No man can do what only God can do. No man can do to shape you and fashion you and form you into the very image that he made you to be. He wants to make you attractive to him. Somebody say attractive. You see, there's a light out there that don't make us attractive in the light of God. That's why for me, I decided a long time ago, I can't, I can't do that light no more. I can't do that light no more. What light I'm talking about? I'm talking about the light that I was in. You find, listen, you find people that's been addicted to drugs, they can't do that life no more. Man, I, I, I know people that's been addicted to stuff in this room. But the same God that found me, he will find you. He will find you. But he says, I stand at the door knocking. I stand at the door knocking. I'm knocking on your door. I'm knocking on your heart. When I knock, don't turn away my knock. I came here, the best birthday present that I could have gotten is his spirit. A greater spirit. A greater spirit. A greater spirit. A greater spirit. See, there ain't no shame in God. There ain't no shame in God. If you're here right now, I want to open up these altars for, for, for a particular, for a particular call. You see, what I've noticed in my 22 years of pastoring and ministry is that we don't have no problem getting saved. We have issues becoming saved. Disciples. You give your life to God. He promised you eternity by you accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. But after you do that, the next part, follow me, is that follow me part. That's where the enemy start putting everything in this world in your path. He start giving, oh, well, I can do this and follow him, no. I can do this and follow him, no. You're teaching yourself. He says, no, let me teach you. Follow me and learn of me. My burden, my yoke is easy, and my burden is life. Learn of me. If you're here right now, and you say, Pastor, I want to become a disciple. I want to follow. I want to follow. I want to become. I want him to make me. I'm tired of trying to make myself. Brand myself. Make myself look good. Give myself successes that don't last. God don't want you to be on no sugar high. He wants you to be on eternity high. The things he promised in his word is yes and amen. Let it be so. Let it be so. Let it be so. Let it be so. Everything in this Bible. Let it be so. So if my journey have just brought me to a place to be a righteous seed for God to put on display, and use my life as a testimony. My wife. Here's the thing about deception. My wife can tell you, she knew something wasn't just right with me. She knew something wasn't just right with me, but she didn't know. You see, somehow we hide out on God. We think we hide out on God because we hide out on people. You see, I hid my crack habit away from her. I hid my crack habit away from her because I honored the God in her. I honored the goodness in her. So I hid my habit away from her. You can become so smooth at living this life thinking you're hiding out, but God sees and it affects everything around you. Some of us are hiding out. And God says, I'm putting a light on you. 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 I don't want you to hide out no more. 
I'm going to put you on front street, not make you shame, but through my word, I'm going to put the light on you. And in your heart, you're going to know he's talking about me. That's me, Lord. I'm the one that's, I need to repent. Somebody say repent. Turn. Turn. Change your mind. Change how you do life. Change your inner self. So that when people see you, they can see Christ. Not a form of religion, not a form of routine, not a form of rituals, but they can see the authentic presence of Christ, the goodness of God in your life. Not through blessings, through your character. Through your character. If you're here right now and you never said yes to following Christ, as a disciple I want to give you this opportunity because we are in that hour I'm going to talk more this, this upcoming Wednesday this upcoming Wednesday about that we had a phenomenal time last Wednesday y'all phenomenal time phenomenal time phenomenal time phenomenal time this Wednesday will be on a whole nother level but right now I want to offer you the opportunity your Lord is sitting on the throne you think he ain't over this service? He's over this service. He's over this service. Imagine him sitting in high, lifted up, looking down on his church, talking to the Father about different individuals in this room. Because that's what he does. He talks to the Father about different people in this room. He know when you're ready. He know when you're ready. Do you know when you're ready? Do you know when you're ready? On the count of one, I want you to walk to this altar. One. 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 There ain't no two. One. 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 The Bible says immediately. What's no thick thinking? What's no hesitating? Immediately. 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 They heard the call and they came. They heard the call and they came. They heard the call and they came. Now I'm still talking because you're still sitting. They heard the call and they came. They heard the call and they came. I know sometimes we get lax in our space, we get in our comfort zone, we get complacent with God. But the opportunity for salvation is now. Let God see your yes now. Not when you get in your car, not when you get home. I wish I would have went up there. I wish I would have answered the call. Now is the time. Answer the call. Answer the call. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here's what I want us to do. We're going to close right here, guys. We'll, we'll close right here. Guys, if we can keep that back doors closed for a second. There's a distraction to me. It's simple. It is simple. Tyler, bless you, sir. It's simple. It's simple. Simple, simple, simple. All God wants is your yes. An authentic yes. A yes that it can endure time. A yes that it can endure temptation. A yes that it can endure trials and tribulation. That no matter what happens, your yes will be your yes. Come hell or high water, your yes is your yes. You're losing friends because your yes is your yes. When you start walking closer to God, people are going to start walking in the other direction. Because they're not going in the same direction you're going in. But that's okay. God, not, God got new friends for you. He got new family members for you. That's your biological family. You don't walk away from them, but they may walk away from you. All I want you to do is with hands lifted up as a sign of surrender. As a sign of surrender. Just as a sign of surrender. The Lord knows your heart. But here's the thing. You're lifting your hands up. Listen, you're lifting your hands up in God's presence. But you got witnesses in this room. People are watching you lift your hands up. You got angels in heaven watching you lift your hands up saying that I pledge my allegiance to the Most High God. I pledge my allegiance to Jesus. No other allegiance do I pledge my allegiance to. No other God do I pledge my allegiance to. I'm signing up for the kingdom. I want to be a Jesus disciple. Unashamedly, I want to be a Jesus disciple. I belong to Jesus. Can you say, I belong to Jesus. 
Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to open up your mouth. Father, right now, I come to you because I heard your call. Jesus, I heard your call. Like the disciples, I heard the call to follow you, to learn of you, for you to teach me and for me to gain a grace to obey your commandments, Lord, that I may grow in grace with you, Lord. Today, Lord, I commit my life and my journey to this road of becoming one of your disciples so that my life can give life to others. That's a part of my life. So Lord, start with me. Put your light in me. Put your way in me. Put your mind in me, Lord. Give me your heart. Take my stony heart and give me a brand new heart made of flesh, Lord. I thank you right now that from this day forward, not only is Jesus my Savior, but he's my Lord. And I will follow my Lord to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for receiving me, not only to your kingdom, but for receiving me as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, there's many temptations out there. I'm praying right now for the power of the Holy Spirit to empower me to walk this walk. I will get weak, but you will make me strong. I will get discouraged, but you will give me courage. I will get distracted, but you will keep me focused on you, Jesus, and the work that you have for me, Lord. So, Lord, from this day forward, let it be ever mindful on my mind that when situations come in my direction, I would ask myself, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Now, Lord, thank you for blessing my mind, blessing my soul, and saving my spirit. Now, Lord, I, though I leave this place, I know I never leave your presence. Thank you for being faithful. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen, amen, amen. To all of our disciples in the house, listen. I want you to come on Wednesday. Come on Wednesday, come on Wednesday, come on Wednesday, come on Wednesday. There's some things that you need that God is dropping from heaven to earth, all right? Come on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Family, I love you. Be blessed and have a great day in the Lord, okay? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll see you Wednesday. God bless you guys.